Hello, welcome back to my channel, Edis English Literature. Today we are going to read Edmund Pensard's sonnet number 75. Amriti. Amriti is a collection of sonnets. It's a sonnet sequence to his uh, beloved Elizabeth Boyle, with whom he subsequently get married. Uh, as he has. has been an epic writer. Uh, his fairy queen has established him as a national writer, first national writer of England after Chaucer. So his uh, sort of poetry is quite interesting one. And this particular sonnet is in the tradition of Elizabethan writing which uh, encompasses the theme of uh, the tension between time and uh, the permanence of our love. Spencer's Amorothy is the finest specimen of Elizabethan sonnets and as I have already said uh, Edmund Spencer has addressed his sonnets to his financier mm -hmm. whom Spencer subsequently married later. So his Amorothy is a saga of love but without scene or remotes, uh, without uh, the changing course of uh, any of the pathos or pains that uh, naturally invest in other sonnets. The sigh of the lover until it feels a kind of final joy and accomplishment of that sort which uh, the tension that the Elizabethan sonnets as well as Latin sonnets bore is quite missing in, in Pensard's sonnet. In fact, it is a marriage tale. It's, uh, though we do not find in Pensard's sonnets that kind of uh, sadness and quietness or the Shakespeare's complaint against his means. The theme of the sonnet number 75 encompasses the traditional question of tensions and permanence. That is the pivotal theme of that term. As per the structure of uh, Spencer's sonnets concerned, the maidenliness as Coldridge has named it, the purity of tone. In fact, uh, the pattern is also pure enough. The body that constitutes a sonnet, that means its wordplay or its perfect design of the words that creates its musicality as well as its meaningful rendering and the totality of expression is thoroughly and minutely being presented in a unique way by Pensar. Pensar's sonnets are little bit distinguished from the sonnets of other Elizabethan sonneteers. In form, though it is written in English style, but the sonnet structure, the line by line structure is quite unique. The sonnet is interlinked, three quatrains are there all are alternative rhymes and at the last there is a couplet standing alone. So the pattern is quite uh, different from that of Shakespearean sonnet. The Shakespearean sonnet is like A B A B first quatrain, C D C D second quatrain. E F E F third quarter and G G that is the couplet. Whereas in Pensarian three quarter are A B A B first quarter the B line is being repeated into the second quarter B C B C then the C is carried forward into third quarter C D C D and finally the couplet E. -E. So that's why it is called interlocked quarter. That is very Pensarian. Mm, though Pensarian variety is a, is a uh, Latin one, uh, but a new variety that is purely Pensar's own. 
and the metrical division is iambic pentameter iambic that means the pentameters mean five divisions are there and each of the division there are two syllables and the second syllable of the each division each meter is stressed so pentarian sonnet structure particularly 75 uh, is a typical one and uh, it confirms and confirms all the rules of pentarian sonnets the, the sonnet 75 begins in a dramatic note. Both lover and the beloved are seated on the sea beach and on the sea beach they are making love and gossiping to each other. And the lover says, I wrote her name upon the strand but came the waves and washed it away. The lover was busy writing her, his beloved's name on the sandy sea beach. But instantly the waves came and washed the name away. Again I wrote it with a second hand, obviously for second time. But came the tide and made my pains his prey. The poet or here the lover wrote the name of his beloved for the second time and in in response to it the tide the waves the current of the sea came and made his pains the very prey the victim of so the pains the lover exercise to make his lady love's names permanent on the sea beach become fruitless, become meaningless in point of time. Then in a dramatic way the lady love ref replied in a dramatic note she started saying vain man that those in vain assay here the first vain v a y n e means proud so you the proud man you making yourself proud enough in front of time why so and why are you attempting vainly to immortalize my name on the sandy seashore so the lady love is quite clear in her point of view that the lover is making a boost of his quality that he will make the lady love's name permanent and that boost is a kind of a pride that he wishes to exercise in front of ravaging time but the reality is that his attempts are in vain a mortal thing so to immortalize i am a subject of mortal i am a subject of mortality i will die Death and decay is a permanent existence of our reality. The reality is that however beautiful, however good looking, however charming and what much or in what extent you love me, there is no power which can withstand the final destination of death. So I am a mortal thing and you are trying to immortalize me. For I myself shall like to this decay. Death and decay is the very subject of this particular poem as well as in many of the sonnets of the Elizabethan period. Death and decay and that of uh, the ravaging time and the power of love and that of power of poetry. All 
this have a dual or battle that particular theme is the subject of this particular poem too so here say, the lady love says i will myself a subject of decay death and destruction and if my name be wiped out likewise and she says that my name that means her name will be wiped out as from this sandy shore which you are writing my name on the sandy beach and the waves are washing it away similarly the name of me on this universe will be wiped out by the ravaging waves of time but the lover replied not that is not the case the things which are below the power of dignity which are less valuable they might be part of death and destruction but you should live by faith to die in dust they will turn into dust but you shall live by fame but you a great position of me a great fame of beauty a great fame of virtue shall live permanently perpetually my words your virtue reared shall eternize here the hyperbaton is there the change of the words in its from its proper location my bhats your bhatchur reared shall eternize my bhats shall eternize your rare bhatchus that is the word that really goes so the poet says that my bhats the lover says my bhats or my poetry my composition will eternize the beauties or the virtues that you possess so my poetry is the sole medium by which i can make a permanence of your qualities and justify your immortality by round about way and in the heaven writes in the heavens write your glorious name in heaven i will write your name full of glory full of exuberance brilliance so your presence your presence is heavenly and that i should stay through my verses and my verses will eternalize you and make a place in heaven and when as death shall all the world subdue the sonorous music of sound w is interesting one so it's alliteration of a sound where when as death shall all the world subdue when death shall come and subdue overpower tame each and every part and parcel of this world of this universe even then our love shall live later life renew our love our amorous trail will live permanent and it will be renewed it will be revived whoever read afterwards so this might be true as we are reading this amurathi 75 after 600 years later so the poet scheme of immortalizing the lady love is quite successful again the the way of making his beloved form perpetual permanent as well as immortal is a very shortcut through writing poetry and that has been exercised by in in shakespearean sonnets in uh, astor villain stella by sidney and such a, such a course of uh, poetic discourse has often met in other sonnets too for pensarian device of triumph of poetry over time and the glorification of love through that medium of poetry is nothing new it's a traditional way of thinking from latin sonnets the trojan model till to the shakespearean one in 
in latter half of poetry in Keats. These are very common. Shakespeare uh, wrote in his sonnet number 18, So long as man can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives these and these gives love to thee. Here this is his lines of poetry. And he addressed it to his fair friend. Keats again wrote the viewless wings of poetry. So he, the transitory world that is uh, for the ravaging power of time should not rule over poet and his medium of exuberance. So poets have a, a poetic canon that is his excellence of writing by which he can immortalize his subject. Such is the case with Edmund Penser's Elizabeth Boyle as well as his sonnet. Penser is in fact very much original in its treatment of dramatic verses and the passion of love that he exhibits here is unparalleled. Simply um, one thing is quite um, contrary though, a poetry which is a subjective one cannot include or should not include a dramatic version. But here that even though the dramatic version has been used, the dialogues has been readily used here, uh, but the subjective term or the telling the heart of the poet is possible through the brilliance of Spencer's writing. Thank you. Hope you all enjoyed this particular poem and spent some time reading it. And if there is any question, you can post in the comment section, like, share and subscribe to my channel. Thank you. Bye-bye.